Bowie's films, Strike, The Chomkin, October, Old and New, Alexander Nevsky, and Ivan Grozny, Timely Problem. Eisenstein's whole life and work were dedicated entirely to the free Soviet people. If the revolution brought me to art, Eisenstein said, art certainly led me to the revolution. I can say that the Soviet power gave me everything, as it did all the people. And like each of us, I am giving and will continue to give my utmost to our country and the great cause of building communism. City of Riga. It was in this house that Sergei Eisenstein was born on the 23rd of January 1898. His father, Mikhail Eisenstein, the chief architect of the city, and his mother, Yulia, devoted great effort and attention to their son's upbringing and gave him a good and all sided education. From childhood, he could speak. His report card used to be filled with grades of excellent, except, strangely enough, in drawing, for which he only received good. But it was in drawing, actually, that Eisenstein's great gifts were most clearly revealed, even as a child. The dull skeleton of the drawing class sickened him. Instead, he filled album after album with countless drawings, giving free rein to his daring imagination, his sharp powers of observance, and keen sense of the ridiculous. He calls this drawing the cube. Each of the 150 figures can be seen as an individual character, someone the artist observed in life and portrayed in a confident and original manner. The 1917 October Revolution found Eisenstein a student at the Petrograd Institute of Civil Engineering. He left the Institute in order to defend the gains of the revolution, at first as a member of the People's Militia and then as a soldier on the fronts of the Civil War. He built defences, drew posters and staged propaganda plays. Later he went to work as an artist at the Moscow Theatre of Proletarian Culture. He helped to stage a performance of The Mexican based on Jack London's story and studied at the studio for stage directors under the famous producer Meyerhold. His goal was to master theatrical art and change it in a revolutionary way. This is a scene from that early production of The Mexican. At the Theatre of Proletarian Culture, Eisenstein said, there's a bit of a fall in every wise man. He conceived this play of Ostrovsky's as an agitational satirical review on international subjects. The staging was eccentric and included a short film featuring his students who were actors at the Proletarian Culture Theatre. Vera Yanukova, Maxim Strauch, Grigory Alexandrov. And this is Eisenstein himself. In his work in the theatre, Eisenstein pursued a tireless quest for new form. He found the stage too narrow in its confines and went to work in the cinema. His first film, The Strike, appeared in 1924, when the Soviet cinema was taking its first steps 
to combat the flood of cheap foreign films. Eisenstein introduced a new hero in contrast to all this rubbish. How the workers laid down their tools in response to exploitation, humiliation and fines were told in forceful and dynamic episodes replete with vivid and faithful detail. A crow on a factory whistle, the factory's idle, pigeons roost on the abandoned machines, the arrows of the manometers are frozen to immobility, at the montage table, the young director sought and found new and original methods of working. A police department album come to life. Soul pigeons and provocateurs were portrayed with brilliant satire. achievement and principal success of a strike. In them, the working class was represented for the first time in cinema art as the force that was moving history as a revolutionary mass. Eisenstein portrayed the brutality of the Tsarist authorities and their ruthless treatment of the unarmed workers. The finest episodes in the strike were tensely dynamic, sharp and unexpected in form and at the same time profoundly lifelike and truthful. In those years, the films had never before known such daring approaches, such complexity of compositional effects combined with documentary authenticity. The newspaper Pravda called the strike the first revolutionary work of the Soviet screen. and the young director was asked to produce a film for the 20th anniversary of the first Russian Revolution of 1905, together with a gifted cameraman, Eduard Tisse, and five assistants, Levshin, Antonov, Gomorov, Strauch, and Alexandrov, he set to work on the film 1905. The screenplay was by Nina Agadjanova. At the beginning, it encompassed all the most significant events of the first Russian Revolution but it soon became obvious that it was impossible to include them all in a single film. And Eisenstein decided to limit the film to the heroic uprising of the crew of the armored cruiser Prince Potemkin of Tavria. The sailors rebelled and refused to eat beetroot and cabbage soup made with maggoty meat. This film was magnificently dynamic. Every shot was inimitably expressive. The innovations introduced by the young director and his many discoveries in the realm of pictorial means were determined by the revolutionary content of the film.
Eisenstein revealed with a roar that was truly inspired how the peaceable civilians who had come to greet the armored cruiser were given ruthless treatment by the Tsarist government. And Eduard Tisse. The film was shown for many years with unvarying success. The armored cruiser Potemkin showed the whole world the force of Soviet revolutionary art. Censors in different countries tried to ban it. But like the revolutionary armored cruiser that rammed through the Tsarist squadron, the Soviet film made its way through all barriers. It was shown all over the world and won the enthusiastic recognition of progressive mankind. Literature on this film exists in all languages. Its influence on film art was unprecedented, and it continues to this day. The contemporary progressive cinema director, Giuseppe De Santis, says, The armor in Italy. Eisenstein was the first to show us the laws of cinematographic form. The art of Eisenstein, and this is a very important thing, bears a special attitude to all that it portrays. Italian film people is their teacher, and in my opinion, the films he made have influenced the entire film world. Eisenstein searched for the most significant themes of his day, and that was why he turned to the history of the 1917 October Socialist Revolution. Working jointly with Alexandre Bentisse, he made the film October for the 10th anniversary of the revolution. Eisenstein was the first to portray Lenin in a feature film. Parallel with inspired heroic scenes, he was brilliantly satirical in depicting the enemies and traitors of the revolution. The pygmy Kerensky, puffed up with illusions of grandeur, he compared metaphorically to a peacock. The speeches of the social revolutionaries and the Menshevik demagogues to the strumming of a balalaika. In his quest for the new, Eisenstein sometimes let himself be carried away by four experiments, as a result of which the film's vision became diffused and the pictorial language excessively complicated. But in the key scenes, he achieved rare expressiveness and great simplicity. He recreated the storming of the Winter Palace with historical accuracy and tremendous revolutionary emotion. The whole sweeping panorama, from the broad masses to a sailor's boot on the imperial crown, as glimpsed by the keen eye of the artist. The film October exerted great and beneficial influence on the development of Soviet art. Lenin's widow, Nadezhda Krupskaya, wrote in the news after viewing the film October, is that a new revolutionary art reflecting the lives of the masses is being born here and taking shape to this art of the future. There are very many fine things about it. Because of their constant quest was new and difficult and needed by the people, Eisenstein, Alexandrov and Tisse tackled one of the complex questions of the day, the theme of the socialist transformation of the countryside. That was how the film The Old and the New was conceived. As had been the case with October, most members of the cast were not professional actors. Eisenstein had the ability of finding people whose physical appearance was expressive of the thought 
the condition or mood he wanted to have conveyed. Through painstaking selection of the characters in the episode The Pilgrimage, the director told the bitter truth about the ignorance and backwardness of old Russia's rural areas and the fanaticism and sluggishness of people who prayed in vain for a drop of rain from their parched fields. The story of how the peasant farmsteads were impoverished, of how people lost their land bit by bit and were ruined. The old was contrasted to the new life. Eisenstein saw the future of this plain Russian woman, Marfa Lapkina, who organized a farm cooperative, confident that by collective work, the people would be infinitely better off. Marfa Lapkina fell asleep. In her dreams, she saw the hope of a farmer, a thoroughbred bull. and rivers of milk, a land of plenty to replace the poverty of the present. A glimpse into the future of the Soviet village was the author's aim in the episode Marfa Lapkina's Dream. He knew that the most daring dreams become reality in the Soviet Union. The film, The Old and the New, had its good and bad points. It was criticized, but it proved very significant, especially in foreign countries. It was the cinema's first contribution, revealing the transformation of the Soviet countryside. Eisenstein's name was becoming more widely known. Eisenstein, Sandra, and Tisse went abroad. As the representative of the new socialist art, Eisenstein lectured in Berlin and Paris, Brussels and London. Tickets for his lectures at Cambridge, Harvard and Sorbonne were in great demand by progressive intellectuals. But the French police ordered Eisenstein to leave the country in 24 hours, arousing an indignant protest from the public. Accompanied by the slander of the reactionaries, but welcomed by all honest people, Eisenstein, with Alexandra and Tisse, landed in the United States. The Soviet film director was so popular that Hollywood studios offered him to make a film. Eisenstein and Alexandrov wrote a scenario for Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy for Paramount Studios for their interpretation of the novel frightened the American film magnate and Paramount Studios cancelled the contract. Organizations going fascist at the time began to distribute leaflets saying down with the red propagandist. Eisenstein went to Mexico with Tisa and Alexandro. Their trip is described by Grigory Alexandrov, today a leading Soviet film director. It was long ago, over a quarter of a century, on the 5th of December 1930, that we went to Mexico at the invitation of friends, among whom were the famous American artists Diego Rivera, David Siqueiros, and many others. Our friends helped us to learn what the real Mexico was like. We planned to do a film about the molding of man's conscience, the fight for freedom and independence of nations, the plain man and his life and work. These are some of our photographs. 
We put in 17 months of hard work and took trips to the most remote and distant parts of Mexico. We shot the sort of film that had never before been seen on the cinema screen. We told the story of human life. A man is born, grows up, gains maturity through work, meets a woman, falls in love, takes part in revolutionary uprisings and encounters of the system of colonialism. The epoch and characters changed, but the story of human life was always one and the same. We decided to have the action cover a span of 2,000 years. As we photographed the magnificent monuments of ancient Mexico, we noticed that the faces of the contemporary Indians had the same features as the stone figures carved thousands of years ago. We photographed amazingly colorful national festivals. This is called Calavero, the day of death. On this fate day, the Mexicans celebrate the victory of life over death. Some copies of the material we had shot in Mexico. But unfortunately, those of them I've been able to see were not at all in line with the author's idea. I worked for many years with Sergei Eisenstein and knew him not only as an outstanding film director but also as a remarkable theoretician, scientist, pedagogue and instructor. Eisenstein's lectures at the USSR State Cinema Institute amazed students for their profound erudition. His brilliant sense of humor often made his lectures an entertaining improvisation. Eisenstein devoted almost 25 years to teaching. Students loved him and he had the deepest admiration for his genius. He headed the film directing department of the Institute and drafted the academic program laying the foundations for the creative study of cinematography. Professor Eisenstein, who was a doctor of arts, educated several generations of Soviet film workers. His lectures were invariably accompanied by drawings down on the blackboard. Eisenstein always drew wherever he was on anything that came to hand. He had the rare ability in a few strokes of conveying a man's character, his psychological state, his movement. Many of his drawings are highly expressive. These are some of his Mexican drawings. His drawings of a barbed edge, sometimes to the point of being almost vicious. Always they reveal his brilliant sense of humor. Sketches for the stage, tragedy, melodrama. There's a similarity to the vigor of Dormier. There were cadres that were to come to life in his future film. Sketches for Alexander Nevsky. In 1934, Einstein started to work on Bezhin Look. This was a film devoted to the class struggle in the countryside.
however, the ideological defects in the scenario, which gave a confused picture of the class struggle, doomed the work to failure. Production was stopped. This creative defeat did not discourage the exacting and sincere artist. Why am I sure of myself and calm about things? I understand what my mistake has been. There can be only one theme for my new work. It must be heroic in spirit, must follow the party line, be militant in content and popular in style. Patriotism, that is our theme. Patriotism and a national rebuff for the aggressor. Eisenstein said at a time when the Second World War had already broken out in the West. When one reads simultaneously the annals of the 13th century and the newspapers of the present day, one loses a sense of the difference in time. The bloody terror spread by the knights of the 13th century differs very little from what is being done today in some of the countries of Europe, wrote Eisenstein when he was shooting the film Alexander Nevsky. There is one Lord in heaven. He has but one prophet on the earth. One sun sheds its light on the universe and illumines the other planet. All that is not submissive to Rome must be extinguished. Things will never come to pass as you wish them. Russia, under the German heel, never. For Russia. For Russia. Einstein rushed to finish his picture as a contribution to the national defense effort and shot the famous battle on the ice in midsummer. Forward now, men, strike the Germans. And this remarkable scene of the battle on the ice is a harmonious combination of screen images, music, speech, and sound effects. The striking effect of an entire nation that has taken to arms was achieved by both mass scenes and vivid individual characters. There's infinite native humor, the mother wit of the Russian people in the craftsman Ignashko who is skilled at forging chain mail. Vasily Buslai, the valiant knight, is so strong, he has never been vanquished. In his work on Alexander Nevsky, Eisenstein penetrated deep into the basic essentials of the art of acting. The roles were played by both stage and film actors. The film's message was that the Russian people were invincible and it prophesied the defeat of all who might come pointing their swords at the Russian land. Alexander Nevsky brought Eisenstein fresh fame. 
Mikhail Kalinin conferred decorations on Eisenstein and Eduard Sisse. Both great artists, their careers had developed together side by side. Eisenstein and his co-workers were awarded Stalin prizes for Alexander Nesky. His sincere interest in the work of his companion, a heart that was always open to everyone who was daring in his work, a heartfelt desire and remarkable ability to understand and help, made Sergei Eisenstein a teacher who was dearly loved by Soviet film people. He is seen here with Mikhail Rom, director, looking over the sets on the first day of work on the film The Dream. Eisenstein's advice, remarks, and proposals were always beneficial and to the point. He was able, as no one else, to summarize experience in art and draw theoretical conclusions from creative factors. In Eisenstein, the artist and the scientist were indivisible. There were times when he was under a delusion and arrived at erroneous or inexact conclusions. But these were the mistakes of a man who was ever searching the experiment of an innovator. He found the answers to many problems of film art. In his semi-humorous drawing, Film Methods, he outlined the structure of cinema theory on the basis of dialectics. He was modest about what had been done and traced the whole structure in only bare outline. However, he left an enormous theoretical heritage. The works of Sergei Eisenstein are to be found among the invaluable manuscripts at the Central State Literature and Art Archive. Historians and scholars of the arts still have a great deal of work before them in studying his ideas and searches, his conclusions and plans. the notes he jotted down on the score of the Wagner opera Valkyrie. Eisenstein produced the opera at the Bolshoi Theatre in 1940. These are some of his ideas for the set. The Eisenstein archive testifies to his full and busy life and the remarkable variety of his interests. That could also be seen in his flat in Moscow. This is where Sergei Eisenstein lived. The flat was his laboratory, museum and library, and it reflected the constant creative quest of a true artist. Eisenstein is a great concern of the art of various nations and was familiar to the finest details with the map of distant countries. He was an authority on the dolls of Mexico, the bright and cheerful colour of the clay toys and wood carving of Russia. These Chinese theatre masks were a gift from Mei Lam Fang. Beside bead embroidery from Georgia, he hung a Russian print, and next to a drawing presented him by the French artist Leger, an old Japanese engraving. But the main passion of his whole life were books. Books and more books. Hundreds and hundreds of these books contain Eisenstein's notes, remarks and plates. There was no limit in his industry. He worked without letter, day and night, for weeks and months at a stretch, his whole life long. Eisenstein constantly followed the development of modern philosophical thought and studied the classics of Marxism. His favorite writers were Pushkin and Gogol, Emil Zola and Vladimir Mayakovsky.
and his favorite artist, Fidato Siron. The Georgian self-taught painter Niko Fidosmanishvili and Dormier, the great Dormier, whose drawings he loved to set it out in the files of old journals. He delves into the old Russian classic, the word about Igor's regiment, and continues to study the history of Mexico. He had the greatest admiration for Russian folk art and for the sharp-edged art of the political poster. Eisenstein was cordial and sensitive, always kind, and in the best of humor. His pupils and friends used to come to see him in his flat. Letters were addressed here from all parts of the world. Henri Barbus wrote, I want in the worst way to see you and have a talk with you. Paul Robeson wrote, How wonderful to find Russia and you on one and the same day. And Theodore Dreiser, I hope that one of my books will come into your hands and that you will produce it. You have given extremely much to Soviet and world cinematography, wrote Alexander Padilla. We are happy that we have friends in Moscow. May that friendship continue. Nay, Lan Fang. You belong, I think, to a generation of soldiers, Civil Lord Vishnev. Your film and the evenings I spent with you are fresh in my mind, Leon Dorfmanga. Eisenstein and Chaplin were bound by a friendship of many years standing, which had begun in Hollywood. Chaplin cabled Eisenstein. The greatest of all historical films. It was conceived as a trilogy. The main theme was the unification of the Russian state under the leadership of the man who first became Tsar and ruler of all Rus, Ivan the Terrible. This was the story of Ivan's struggle against those who opposed the unity of Moscow's power and the fight he waged against those who raised their hand against Moscow. The characters in this picture were complicated and vivid. Anastasia, Ivan's dearly loved wife. Malutus Kuratov, his faithful but brutal follower. Ivan made the Russian state stronger by waging a merciless struggle against the boyar. He was betrayed by Prince Kurbsky, and his childhood friend, Philip Kolichev, entered a monastery. A terrible destiny was threatened by Metropolitan Pinin. Princess Staritskaya threatened punishment by the Boyars. In his quest for profound tragedy, Eisenstein became too much preoccupied in the second part of the trilogy with Ivan's doubts, suffering and sick psychology and was faced with the necessity of redo. These are drawings for the final episodes of the trilogy when Maluta is dying but victorious. They carry one across Livonia, then in flames. The film was to have ended with the Russian troops emerging to the Baltic Sea to restore to the Russian state its own lands temporarily held by other countries. And the unconquered waves of the Livonian Sea washed the feet of the menacing Russian Tsar. The wealth of material reveals the great director's creative laboratory. He made dozens of drawings and sketches in order to find the makeup he wanted for the youthful Ivan. And he arrived at quite a different plastic solution to portray Ivan during his mature years. This was his version of Eprosenia Staritskaya. and metropolitan Pime, as old and dry as a corpse. A few strokes of the pen became a sketch and then embodied into an appearance, an actor's costume and makeup. Eisenstein went from idea to drawing, from drawing to the placing of his characters on the set.
he sought the maximum expressiveness of composition at his drawing board and then went ahead competently transferring it to the screen. Before the camera went into action, he had a clear picture of what he wanted. He could not only see it in his mind's eye, but could hear the musical background. His friendship of many years standing with Sergei Prokofiev led to complete mutual understanding, to the harmonious fusion of two great and vivid talents. The music was an organic part of the fabric of dramatic action. It produced a sharper delineation of the heroes and events. Okay. Submit to the church, Ivan. Confess. Do away with the Africhina. Before it's too late, the Tsar is advised. Silence. I will be that which I am reputed to be. Inexorable, says. Eisenstein achieved the maximum effect from every scene and shot. This scene at Alexandrovsky suburb has figured many times in world literature. Ivan the Terrible was Eisenstein's last film. A serious illness prevented him from finishing the trilogy. Sergei Eisenstein passed away early on the morning of February the 11th, 1948. He died when his career was in full flower and left a wealth of ideas and plans unfinished. He had dreamt of making a colour film about his beloved poet Pushkin. He left behind him the scenarios, sketches and a detailed outline of the action of the entire scene. He had done a great deal of work on the famous monologue of Boris Godunov. These are his costume drawings for the ballet, The Queen of Spain. He also turned to the remote past and had planned to do a film about Nero, the dictatorial Roman emperor. It was Eisenstein's goal to tie the past and the present together. His scenario about the construction of the Ferganar Canal encompassed events from Tamerlane to her own day. Eisenstein recreated the fierce warriors of Tamerlane faithfully and took contemporaries right from life. 
he had planned a big color film about the Soviet capital, Moscow, in ancient times and today. Although many years have elapsed since Eisenstein's death, his memory and influence are still fresh. His writings and books about his life and work continue to be published. His articles, scenarios and letters are printed in Soviet journals. Future directors, scriptwriters and actors make a careful study of his works, while students of the State Cinema Institute and the minutes of his highly interesting lectures are always available to them. His drawings are exhibited in Moscow and abroad. Exhibitions are held illustrating his life and work. Memorial tablets mark the homes where Sergei Eisenstein once lived. Scientific sessions and special meetings are often held in memory of this great artist who was a classic of the Soviet film art. People all over the world are still deeply moved by his immortal film. Eisenstein is alive today because art that is recognized by a free people never dies. To create without time, to search without hindrance, to work, work and work again, carry to millions the magnificent ideas of contemporary time. Sergei Eisenstein.